This presentation is brought to you by the Colorado Neurological Institute Movement Disorder Center. My name is Dr. Rajiv Kumar and I am the Medical Director of the Colorado Neurological Institute Movement Disorder Center. Surgery is an effective therapy for patients who have medication refractory motor fluctuations, dyskinesias, as well as troublesome tremor. Surgery is increasingly being performed now because of the further recognition of the disability caused by motor fluctuations and dyskinesias, as well as the development of more effective and safer surgical procedures, such as deep brain stimulation. Surgery is invasive and can have significant risks, but can substantially improve disability and quality of life. It is very important for the patient, as well as the patient's family, to fully understand all of this information to best make a decision for or against surgery. Surgical treatment for Parkinson's disease is indicated for patients who have disabling motor complications despite maximal drug therapy. This includes disabling levodopa-induced dyskinesias, medication refractory disabling tremor, or marked motor fluctuations in which there is a variation in mobility from extremely immobile to good functioning. Surgical treatment is very helpful to treat motor complications, but with the exception of improving tremor, does not significantly improve the patient's best response to levodopa. Effectively, surgery allows patients to function as they do during their best peak time on levodopa, with significant reduction in dyskinesia and marked reduction in motor fluctuations. Preoperative response to levodopa is the best indicator of a patient's response to surgical treatment. In general, patients who are good candidates for surgery have had Parkinson's disease for five to ten years or more and have significant disability as a result of motor fluctuations, dyskinesias, or disabling tremor. They should not have significant cognitive impairment or dementia since surgery may in fact worsen this problem. Because of the risks of surgery, there should be a reasonable expectation of several years of life expectancy following surgery for the risk-benefit ratio to be reasonable. Even elderly patients who are in good general health and are cognitively well may be considered for surgery if they otherwise fulfill the criteria. The preoperative evaluation and subsequent treatment of patients considered for surgical treatment includes a movement disorder specialist neurologist, neurosurgeon, neuropsychologist, and commonly a physiatrist or rehab specialist. The neurologist is responsible for the preoperative evaluation as well as the post-operative deep brain stimulation programming and ongoing clinical care. The neurosurgeon is responsible for the overall surgery and management of any surgical complications. Virtually all patients who are considered for surgical treatment for Parkinson's disease should undergo detailed neuropsychological testing. The neuropsychologist advises on the patient's candidacy for surgery based on his or her evaluation of the patient's cognition and any potential mood issues. Many patients benefit from physical, occupational, and speech therapy postoperatively in combination with deep brain stimulation programming in order to optimize their benefit. A rehab specialist can help to best coordinate this care. There are two main surgical methods which are used routinely in clinical practice. Deep brain stimulation involves implanting an electrode in a target site and hooking this up to a pacemaker-like device to deliver an electric signal to that area of the brain. Lesioning surgery involves destroying the target site with a radio frequency probe to abolish the abnormal signals coming from this dysfunctional region of the brain. In general, lesioning procedures are performed infrequently in the United States since the effect is permanent and cannot be adjusted after surgery. Deep brain stimulation allows for modification of both the beneficial and adverse effects after surgery by programming the pacemaker-like device. This may result in better effects and certainly results in fewer complications. There are three main surgical sites for Parkinson's disease treatment, the subthalamic nucleus, the globus pallidus, and the thalamus. Surgery is most commonly performed in the subthalamic nucleus and the globus pallidus on either one side or both sides of the brain. In these locations, deep brain stimulation can significantly improve all of the major motor features of Parkinson's disease, including bradykinesia, 
rigidity, tremor, and to a certain extent, gait. On the other hand, surgery in the thalamus improves only tremor. When surgery is performed on one side of the brain, the major benefit is seen on the opposite or contralateral side. For example, surgery on the left side of the brain predominantly results in improvement on the right side of the body. Some patients may require only surgery on one side of the brain, whereas other patients may require bilateral surgery. Deep brain stimulation involves implanting an electrode in the target region in order to alter the pattern of abnormal cell firing. The electrode is connected to a pulse generator or pacemaker-like device, which is implanted usually in the area below the collarbone. This is connected to the electrode by a cable tunneled underneath the skin of the neck and scalp. The surgical implantation of the electrode is most commonly performed with the patient awake to allow for continuous monitoring of effects of stimulation during the electrode implantation procedure. The remainder of the hardware, including the pulse generator and connector cable, is implanted under general anesthesia. Setting the stimulation parameters of the pulse generator or pacemaker-like device is usually referred to as deep brain stimulation programming. Programming is usually begun one or two weeks after surgery. The stimulation frequency, amplitude of stimulation, and other parameters can be altered in order to maximize benefit and minimize adverse effects. Typically, patients are repeatedly examined as different stimulation settings are tested. This process may require repeated evaluations over days or weeks. Usually, by two to three months after surgery, the stimulation settings are optimized. While the stimulation settings are being adjusted, anti-Parkinson medication is usually altered and is commonly reduced, especially with subthalamic nucleus stimulation. There needs to be good cooperation and communication between the patient and neurologist in order to facilitate recognition of optimal stimulation settings to allow for avoidance of adverse effects. The pulse generator batteries last on average four to five years before needing replacement. Recently, a rechargeable pulse generator has become available, which requires replacement only every nine years. With unilateral globus pallidus or subthalamic nucleus deep brain stimulation, improvement in overall Parkinsonism by approximately 30% is typical. If surgery is performed on both sides of the brain, patients improve on average 50 or 60% compared to their off state. Tremor, bradykinesia, and rigidity generally improve more than gait and balance. With the improvement of off-period Parkinsonism, motor fluctuations are markedly improved. As a result, patients commonly function near their best preoperative state all of the time but with significantly less dyskinesias. In clinical trials, patients undergoing bilateral subthalamic stimulation had an increase in on time by about six hours per day on average. Unfortunately, surgical treatment of Parkinson's disease does not stop disease progression and does not improve symptoms that are not improved at the peak effect of levodopa, with the exception of tremor. As a result, it is important to emphasize that the preoperative response to levodopa is highly predictive of the response to surgery. The best on-state function is not improved after surgery. In addition, certain symptoms may actually be worsened by surgery, including difficulties with balance, cognitive and psychiatric difficulties, dysphagia or swallowing difficulties, and slurred speech. The presence of any of these difficulties preoperatively should be carefully evaluated when making a decision about the appropriateness for surgery. Like all surgical procedures, deep brain stimulation and lesioning have potential complications and risks. The risk of bleeding into the brain or hemorrhage is about 1-2% to for unilateral surgery and 2-4% to for bilateral surgery. Because a mechanical device is implanted, there is also a risk of infection of either the wound or the device. This risk approaches 5 to 10 percent and is maximal in the first two or three months after surgery. Because patient movement results in stress on the hardware, this may fracture or erode through the skin. This may occur even many years after surgery. Some patients may experience transient confusion or hallucinations during and immediately after surgery. This is most apt to occur in patients who have some preoperative cognitive impairment. 
Usually this gradually resolves over one to two weeks after surgery. Weight gain, averaging approximately 20 pounds, is common after bilateral subthalamic nucleus deep brain stimulation. This patient has bilateral subthalamic nucleus deep brain stimulation. She is first shown with both stimulators off and having withheld anti-Parkinson medication overnight. She demonstrates a reduction in facial expression as well as right greater than left sided bradykinesia. She has minimal tremor. She has difficulty with rotary hand movements such as mimicking screwing in a light bulb, especially on the right side. She also has difficulty with foot tapping. Her gait is characterized by slow speed, reduced stride length, poor arm swing, and a flexed posture. Here the patient is shown with both subthalamic nucleus stimulators on, but again without any anti-Parkinson medication. There is significant improvement in facial expression as well as bradykinesia of limb movements. Although improved, there is still mild residual bradykinesia without anti-Parkinson medication. Gait speed, posture, stride length, and arm swing are all improved with stimulation. This patient has unilateral left globus pallidus deep brain stimulation. He has mild resting tremor in both hands. He has right greater than left sided bradykinesia when performing rotary hand tasks. He also shows right greater than left sided bradykinesia with foot tapping. His gait is slightly slow with reduced right sided arm swing. Here the patient is shown with his unilateral left globus pallidus stimulation on. He has very mild residual right hand tremor. There is a reduction of his bradykinesia on both sides of the body, but mostly pronounced on the right side given his unilateral left-sided stimulation. Speed and quality of gait as well as arm swing are improved with stimulation. The exact mechanism by which deep brain stimulation works is not fully known at present. This is an area of hot investigation. It is thought that abnormally overactive circuits are disrupted by the effect of deep brain stimulation, allowing normal circuitry to take over motor control. Although deep brain stimulation is the current major surgical technique used, there are a number of trials of experimental surgical therapies, including gene therapy. Surgery can be very effective for the appropriate patient, but the experience of the surgeon and the surgical team can highly influence the results. Here at the Colorado Neurological Institute, we're extensively involved with deep brain stimulation and other surgical therapies. I hope that you have found this educational video to be helpful and will tune in for future presentations as part of this Parkinson's disease educational video series.